the Buddha talks about our sense of who we are. He talks about it in, in the context of karma, because we make a sense of who we are. He calls it I-making and my-making. And there's not just one I or one my. For each desire you have a sense of self, especially the desires you've acted on. There's the self that wants to experience pleasure as a result of the desire. And there's the self that wants to find the powers or to have the powers to bring that desire about. And then there's the author of the desire itself. So we have to, even with one desire, you have a cluster of three selves right there. And multiply that by all the different desires you have. And you realize you've got a whole got a whole herd in here. And so when you're sitting down to meditate, it's not just you, it's all of the you's in there. And some of them want to meditate and others would like to do other things. And so when you're sitting here, there's an enormous question about where your allegiance is right now, because sometimes they're split. Part of you wants to sit and get the mind still, quiet. Other parts want to do other things. And they have all kinds of agendas and all kinds of reasons. And so you have to be a little wary, because some of them may seem like friends and not actually be your friends. Some may be taking on the voice of authority, saying, you have to do this, you have to worry about that, you have to plan for this. You're irresponsible if you don't do that. And you have to sort things out, exactly where do those responsibilities lie. Others don't have any real reasons, they just come on with a lot of force. It's just like politics. So an important part of the meditation is to remind yourself of why you're here, what kind of happiness you've seen in the world, what kind of happiness that you've seen from following your greed, your lust, your aversion, your fears. And then weigh those pleasures with uh, the pain you felt by following those things. And you ask yourself, have you learned your lessons? And if one of these internal selves is coming on really strong, you need some tools for at least fending it off. For the time being, you want some space here inside so you really can settle down, so the members of the committee that do want to settle down have a chance to get a sense of well-being and ease with a breath. Which means you can't grab onto the breath and force it, but you want to just simply allow it to be comfortable. To flow in different parts of the body, have a sense of the energy flowing all around without any obstacles. So the parts of the mind that want to settle down will have some, some allies. And the part of the mind that wants immediate gratification, immediate pleasure. We'll be able to find it, so that when greed, aversion, and delusion do come up, your allegiances are more on the side of the quiet, the stillness, concentration, the mindfulness. Because the Buddha does give you lots of tools to deal with these seeming friends inside. But the important factor always is. You try to identify the parts of the mind that really do want the tools to work, because it's very easy if your allegiances are someplace else. Say, well, I've gone through the tools, so they don't work, I guess I have to just go along with the lust or go along with the aversion. We didn't really give the tools a proper chance. For example, one of the chants we have, 32 parts of the body, 
it's a really good tool for dealing with lust. And there are a lot of ways that people have of resisting that particular meditation. But you look at it and it's very simple. Just think about what is the body made of. Hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, down to the bones, down to the different internal organs, and all the different liquids in the body, the blood, the lymph, the urine, the oils, the saliva, things we don't talk about in polite company, and certainly not the things you want to think about when you're beginning to align yourself with the lust. That's exactly why you want to think about these things. It helps cut you short, or helps cut that particular member of the committee short. If you're lusting for somebody, you say, well, you're lusting for their liver, you're lusting for their large intestines, their small intestines, their stomach, the contents of the stomach. No. You know, these things lie just a few micromillimeters under the skin. So it's a good contemplation. But the point is you've got to find which members of the committee want to use it, and then you strengthen them. You reaffirm your allegiance, and you find that the tools have a lot more likelihood of working. Same with aversion. There's somebody you really don't like. But if you act on that strong dislike, what are you going to do? You're going to start doing a lot of unskillful things. You've got to keep that person's well-being in mind. Now, it doesn't mean you have to please the person or do what that person wants, but you want to make sure you don't do anything to harm that person. So it's good to remind yourself of all the good things that person has done for you, the help that person has given you. It's here where the Buddha's teachings on gratitude are important, because you realize if there's somebody who's helped you, and you turn around and you're really harsh with them, or unkind, or hurtful, it's really unfair. And then if you respond to kindness with hurtfulness, it takes civilization down one notch. So you try to remind yourself of the good things that person has done, or said, or thought for you. And even though there may be a resistance, as if that person doesn't deserve it, or I'm going to be trapped in that person's net if I think nice things about the person, you have to remind yourself, no, you're doing this for your own protection, so that when you are dealing with that person, you're not going to do anything harmful. You're not going to give rein to any of your harmful desires or reactions. So it's for your own sake that you're thinking about that person's good points, because you don't want to create any bad karma. When you're feeling lazy, you think about death. Not to get yourself depressed, but just to remind yourself that there's work that needs to be done and you've got a chance right now. You better do it now, because you can't wait until later. It's that kind of thinking about death that's actually useful. If you think about it in a way that gets you depressed, you're not using the thought right. As the Buddha said, if you remind yourself, if I get one more chance to breathe in and breathe out, I'll use it to practice. Well, here it is, one more chance right now. So use it. The purpose of this is to give you a sense of the importance of right here, right now. Because you have this right here, right now, but you don't know how much longer you're going to have a right here or a right now. So you make the best use of what you've got. Whatever the unskillful thought, whatever the unskillful member of the committee, you've got to remind yourself, this is not my friend. This is not helping me. And John Sawat mentions how we often hate pain, but we love our cravings, without reflecting on the fact that it's the craving that leads to the pain, leads to the suffering.
you should have a more friendly attitude towards pain, because it reminds you. This is an issue you have to watch, and this is an issue you have to learn about. And remember, your craving is, is the enemy. Of course, you have to sort out which desires are helpful and which ones are not. The desire to act skillfully and to avoid unskillful behavior, that's, that's a desire that's your true friend. But it's the craving for sensuality, the craving to take on this identity or that identity. Those are the ones that are going to cause you suffering. So you have to sort things out. You have friends in the mind and you have enemies in the mind, and they're all labeled you. All these different identities that you've taken on. It's like that wife of the dictator had 5,000 pairs of shoes in her closet. At one point, sometimes she must have worn those shoes, and then she kept them all. You've got thousands of selves in here. And you've got to sort out which are the ones that are really helpful, which are the ones that are enemies in disguise. Now, fortunately, they can all talk with one another. And this is one of the purposes of meditation, is to create a neutral place where there is a sense of ease, there is a sense of well-being. <laughs> so that the really hungry and exasperated and impatient selves can be fed a sense of pleasure. And then you can talk to them and point out to them, okay, we all want to be happy, but the happiness that this particular self or that particular self is proposing is not going to lead to long-term happiness. It's going to lead to pain down the road. And then that self will say, I don't care. I want what I want right now. I said, no, look, it's going to, it's going to be painful. If you're, if you're me, I don't want to suffer. And those selves, the ones that want pleasure right now and are willing to suffer pain down the line, those are the ones that run away when the actual suffering comes and you're left holding the bag. So it's tricky. You're talking to yourself. You're talking to yourselves, and each one of them claims to be you. And you've had experience with each of one of them being you at one point or another. So you have to learn how to identify with the, the selves that want long-term happiness, to realize that you have to behave responsibly in order to find that happiness, who realize that there are things that you like to do that give pleasure and things that you don't like doing that give rise to pain in the long term. But then there are also the problematic ones, the ones that things you like to do that give pain down the line or things you don't like to do that give pleasure down the line. You've got to strengthen the, the selves that really are concerned with the long-term results. The selves that have learned to be patient, the selves that have learned to be responsible. The selves that really do have your long-term best interests in mind. And so you have to sort out all your various allegiances here. Because as I said, the difficult part is at some point in time you've identified with all the members of the committee. But it's best to see them as tools or as outfits you've put on. Just because you put a certain outfit on back when you were a child doesn't mean you need to wear it now. In fact, it's pretty inappropriate. There's some really old tools that you used. Like that far side cartoon of the picture of a cow's tools. You look at the tools and you don't see any possible use for them at all. But the cow is very proud that it made them. We've created different sense of selves in our eye making and my making. And a lot of them have really limited uses. So in one sense we're doing some house cleaning here. Instead of looking at the selves as who we are, look at them as tools. Some of the tools are useful, some of them are not. And throw out the old ones that are not any use anymore. 
Well, the ones that continue to hang around learn how to convert them so that they like to meditate too. They want true happiness too. Same with all the different outfits you've worn. Figure out which ones were your baby clothes, which ones are the things you wore when you're six years old, twelve years old, whatever. Realize they don't fit anymore. Keep only the clothes that are, are useful. Don't get carried away by my nostalgia. And if you don't see any of the selves in there that you like, well, here's one of the things we do when we meditate, is we create a new sense of self around the meditation. So try to make it a healthy self. Because each self, especially the, the useful ones, are created around skills. We're working on a good skill here. Learning to find a sense of well-being simply by the way we breathe, a perfectly harmless happiness, perfectly harmless pleasure. And even though it may take a, a while to gain a sense of skill around this, it is possible. And once you have this skill, you find that it's a really true friend. <laughs>